This is the top ten fallacies, mistaken beliefs, faulty reasoning, and unsound arguments in Judaism. Top ten. First one, the covenant of friendship that comes with Moshe, the anointed one of Isaiah 11, the descendant of King David, and promises of Jeremiah 31, refute a Messianic era. Rambam says in his Mishnah Torah that in the Messianic era, Moshiach will compel all of Israel to walk in the way of the Torah, perfect the entire world, motivating all the nations to serve God together. There will be neither famine nor war, neither envy nor competition, the entire world will be solely to know God. And the Jews will therefore be great sages and know the hidden matters with an understanding of their creator to the full extent of human potential. He also says, at their time, <clears throat> at that time, there will be no hunger or war, no jealousy or rivalry, for the good will be plentiful and all delicacies available as dust. The entire occupation of the world will be only to know God. The people of Israel will be of great wisdom. They will perceive the esoteric truths and comprehend their Creator's wisdom as is the capacity of man. Ramdan made every bit of that up. That's not in the Scripture. Nothing even close to that. But what do we have when Moshiach comes? Well, there's two covenants yet to be delivered. The covenant of Jeremiah 31, the covenant that God says he will write Torah on everyone's heart and everybody will heed him because he will forgive their sins and remember them no more. Sin forgiveness, that's what that covenant is. The other covenant comes with David. It's called the Covenant of Friendship. And it differs markedly from this time that Rambam is talking about. That's not in the Scripture. Here's what's in the Scripture. The Covenant of Friendship with Moshe, the descendant of King David. In the day of the Lord, when Moshe comes, this is where the words of Rambam should be, if they were God's words. But they are not. They're Rambam's words. And that's not scripture. Here's what God promises in his covenant of friendship. He will send down the rain in its season. The trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and the land shall yield its produce. The Jewish people shall continue secure on their own soil and never be overthrown and uprooted again. They shall no longer be a spoil for the nations. He will establish for them a planting of renown. There shall be no, they shall <clears throat> no more be carried off by famine. They shall not have to bear again the taunts of the nations. They shall know that the Lord their God is with them, and they, the house of Israel, are his people. He will establish them and multiply them. He will place his sanctuary among them forever. Never defeated and uprooted again. No longer the taunts of the nations. Those are the highlights. God's coming to return to his temple. Of course, we know there's not one built. Elijah clears the way for him. It is Elijah that makes sure the temple gets built for his return. His presence shall rest over them, and when his sanctuary abides among them forever, the nations will know that the Lord sanctifies Israel. There's nothing in here about perfecting the world and the whole world being to know nothing but God. There's nothing like that. It's supposed to be a time of in the, the Messianic era where there is no sin. 
He just made it up. He's a religious man, and that would be the perfect world for him. But that's not in the scripture. I just read to you what the scripture said. That's what God says. This is what I'm going to do for you. Israel shall bloom again. I'm going to place my sanctuary there. So he already knows when he has this written in Ezekiel, he already knows the temple's not going to be there in the day of the Lord. And that's where he's, when he says, I'm coming back, return to my temple suddenly. But he's saying right here, I'm going to place it. I'm going to place it. He's going to use, he's going to use Moshe, the righteous servant, Elijah, the prophet like Moses, to clear the way for him. The Messianic era that is said to begin when the northern wood comes, whom God calls his servant David, a shepherd. He's not King Moshe. That's another thing Rambam just made up. He's got two full chapters in the Mishnah Torah called King Moshe. All these things King Moshe is going to do and establish the Davidic covenant and dynasty. None of which is in the scripture. He's a shepherd. He's a teacher. Not a rabbi. He's a teacher. And he was believed by the early sages and rabbis of antiquity to be described in Isaiah 53. And the Babylon Talmud called him the leper scholar. So despite these two fabricated chapters of Rambam's mission of Torah on King Moshe, David is appointed the only shepherd not dismissed by God. One of the top ten things Judaism just refuses to acknowledge is that when Moshe comes, and he comes with the covenant of friendship, God has a reckoning and dismisses all of the shepherds and will only recognize Moshe as a shepherd amongst the flock. Not over, not ruling, not a king, among the flock. And I'm going to get to this shortly, you can't get around it, but I'm Moshe. God first spoke to me 13 years ago, and in this top 10 things, fallacies of Judaism, I'm going to get to better explanations of that. But recognize this, he gave me all this knowledge. This is how I know these things. The Messianic era fails to take into account God's reckoning and dismissal of the rabbis and having the glory of the people hurled to the ground by God of Isaiah 63 and utter destruction to the land of Malachi 3 if God's representation of Isaiah 53 is not recognized, who is the Moshiach of Isaiah 11. Now, I believe the realities of the day of the Lord, which is here, and I'll get to that, and the days of Moshiach will be much better than what Mr. Rambam had to say. Utopia is not here. And it doesn't fit humanity. Man is not made to live in utopia on earth. Period. It doesn't fit our nature. So utopia is not here. There will be no messianic era. You're not going to be the taunts of nations. God's going to set his temple amongst you. Never be uprooted again. And the land will flourish. Which of course it's already done. It blooms again. Second, second, the top ten fallacies of Judaism. And this is this has got to be one of the biggest. The Holy Spirit, also known as the Spirit of the Holy God, also known as the Angel of His Presence, and also known as the Angel of the Lord, is a person. Judaism does not recognize the Spirit of God as being a person. And as you'll see, that's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous. 
God created all things, including spirit and souls, that together form persons. The first person he created was the person of his spirit, who is the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit. I mean, think about it. You, I mean, your spirit is always with you. Okay, and he's got an angel of his presence. That means that angel is always with him. Do the same person, as I'll get to. This is from Isaiah 63, verses 9 and 10. And all their troubles, he was troubled. And the angel of his presence delivered them. In his love and pity, he himself redeemed them. That's the angel of his presence. Raised them and exalted them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Then he became their enemy and himself made war against them. Well, we know the angel of his presence is his person. And the Holy Spirit is grieved. We, if you're an inanimate element of the unseen, you can't be grieved. To be grieved, you have to be a person. Now, I don't know why Judaism can't read that. And it's very important. Because, because it's why Judaism doesn't understand what a man in divine beings is. A host of the Lord's host, which I also will be getting to. There are still three men to come in the Hebrew Bible. Okay, two covenants, three more men, Moshe, Elijah, and the prophet like Moses. Each of these great men were righteous, and all three were servants of God. They're all righteous servants. One more man to come is God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53. The Moshiach, the Moshiach, the anointed one. Well, this is where you find out his main anointment. It's to make the many righteous. Anointing to do what? Why is he the anointing? What's he going to do? Primarily, we see he's going to make the many righteous. So you got four righteous servants and only one description. God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53 is implicitly and explicitly all four men. Now, that's a heck of a Moshiach if you think about it. He's God's righteous servant. He's Moshiach, descendant of uh, King David. He's Elijah and, and the prophet like Moses. I mean, you figure the last prophet of God is really going to be something. And what it really means is he's got a lot of things to do because he's got to handle the task, for instance, writing. Okay, that way you would look to the prophet like Moses, right? God's horse, because he wrote the Torah. God dictated it to him. Elijah, you want to find out things about heaven. The only man specifically taken to heaven, and he returns. Well, what does he know? Well, he knows how angels are created, and I'm about to get to that. The sages knew you had to have the scripture of Moshe, and it was Isaiah 53. They called Moshe the leper scholar. Of course you have to have the description. Four righteous servants, one description. It has to, he has to be all four. Okay, I am Moshe, God's righteous servant, which means I'm also Elijah and the prophet like Moses. But my name is Keith. As Elijah, God has taught me all the matters of heaven I may need as a proof including how the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, was created. It is important for understanding how God is in his spirit. Again, our spirit is within us. We're in our spirit, our spirit is in us. Wherever God's presence is, the spirit is. Wherever God's presence is, the angel is. The short answer is this. I'm about to read it. God created an angel, and for his body... He made his own spirit the body of that angel. Doesn't have the human form and wings. Here's how he did it. 
He created a special soul because we, this is the Holy Spirit of God, his constant companion. So he's a person far above any of us. God creates a special soul and places it before his face and speaks the words, I am. But God does not use his voice. He becomes the person he is creating. He uses the childlike voice of an angelic person. He speaks to the angel as God and answers for the angel as the angel himself in a childlike voice. God simulates being this new person for ages and ages until he is perfect as God would have him be. Then God releases that special soul into his spirit from before his face with the breath of life. And the person of the Spirit of God was created, an angel whose body is the Spirit of the Holy God, the Holy Spirit. And he is a person. Angels are people, persons. God is always in him. God was him. God can always place the person of his spirit before his face and be him and speak as him and through him. And this is how God, my name, Hashem, is in the angel that was sent to guard the Israelites on the way to the promised land and in the angel of the Lord in the burning bush. You know, Moses... No, it says, when Moses saw the burning bush, the angel of the Lord was in the bush, and God speaks. Well, that's how it happens. And nobody in Judaism knows this. First of all, they rule out that the Holy Spirit is even a person, and they, if they recognize an angel of his presence, I've never seen it. They're the same angel, the angel of God's presence, angel of the Lord. Despite the teaching of Judaism, to the contrary, the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, is a person. If God's Holy Spirit can be grieved, he is a person. Only a person can be grieved. God is not spirit. He created all things, including spirits and souls, that together form persons. Persons of spirit, persons of angels, and the persons of human beings. God is absolute power and absolute knowledge. And he is a person. This is from um, Exodus 23, verses 20 through 22. I am sending an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have made ready. Pay heed to him and obey him. Do not defy him. For he will not pardon your offenses, since my name, since Hashem, is in him. Judaism doesn't even see it. But if you obey him and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. The angel sent before the Israelites in the Exodus is the angel of God's presence, the Holy Spirit. Where God dwells and moves about as he did with Moses and the Israelites, his Holy Spirit is with him. In Isaiah 63, when the Israelites grieved his Holy Spirit, God became their enemy and himself made war against them. More proofs of the person of the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel says in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, And he, God, Say to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet, that I may speak to you. As he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet, and I heard what was being spoken to me. God is in his spirit. His spirit lit upon and entered Ezekiel, and upon entering him, he can now hear God's voice. He's a man in divine beings. He's got an angel, a Holy Spirit within him, and God. Both are persons, divine beings, plural. So when Jacob wrestles with an angel, you know, he said, I wrestle with a man of divine beings. 
Well, that's all it was. I just went to the man and said, I need you to go wrestle with this fellow. We're going to come with you. He's not an angel. The man was not an angel. He was just being directed and commanded what to do by God in his spirit within the man. They had entered him. Okay, so what happens in Isaiah 11, verses 1 and 2? The anointed one, descendant of David, the Spirit of God alights upon him. Well, just as with Ezekiel, alights upon him and enters, and God is in his Spirit. Moshe instantly becomes a man of divine beings. Further showing the person of the Holy Spirit, Ezekiel says, The presence of the Lord ascended from the midst of the city and stood on the hill east of the city. Now what do we have? Ezekiel has a spirit in him and God is in him. In this particular verse and chapter, uh, chapter 11, verses 23 through 25, God is showing that he is still one. He ascends. He leaves Ezekiel in the spirit. Rises over the walls of Jerusalem and goes and stands upon a hill, it says. East of the city. And then this. A spirit carried me away and brought me in a vision by the spirit of God to the exiled community in Chaldea. The spirit of God is taking Ezekiel in a vision. He's using a spirit to do it. Another spirit. So that means he's got to be a person. And God's showing why I am in my spirit. My spirit's in me. I'm still one. We are separate and apart from each other. We're just always together. It's like two clouds. The presence of God. Some elements of the unseen. It's his mind. It's where he feels he is. The Holy Spirit. Well, he's made of spirit. Elements of spirit. Like clouds, they have floated together and basically merged. But they're still separate. They're, they're completely different entities. But if the Spirit alights upon you, and anytime you see a prophet say God's words, the Spirit of God has lit upon and entered him, and God is in the Spirit. But they are separate. But, but here again is an example that the Holy Spirit is a person, the Spirit of God. Took Ezekiel on a vision. I don't know how Judy is or misses it. So, you know, the power to take a man into a vision comes from God. Holy Spirit doesn't have power. The only entity in the unseen realm of God with power is God himself. He doesn't give power to angels. If they got to do something, he's behind it. So, Ezekiel says, When he returns, and he says, and he tells the exiles all the things the Lord had shown him. The Lord had shown him. But it's the Spirit of God that took him on the vision. That he's telling the exiles, this is what the Lord... So basically, the Lord became a part of the vision. Even though he's standing on a hill again, it was to show his oneness. And the separation between the two. These are the things that Elijah God taught me. I mean, he's been he had to teach me the scripture. I was an atheist for 50 years. First thing he said was, uh, we need to go to the bookstore and get you a Tanakh. And I said, what's a Tanakh? I had never read the Bible. That was 13 years ago. Next. Third of the top ten fallacies of Judaism. A host of the Lord's host. 
Here's the story of Jacob. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the break of dawn. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he wrenched Jacob's hip at its socket, so that the socket of his hip was strained as he wrestled with him. Then he, the man, said, Let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But he, Jacob, answered, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And here's a man that just jumped on him and started wrestling with him. A man in divine dance, he says. I will not let you go unless you bless me. Said the other, what is your name? He replied, Jacob. Said he, and this is now Elohim speaking. Your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have stirred with beings divine and human. And have prevailed. We all know he didn't really prevail. That's just story, that part. You can't prevail against the power of God. It's absolute. And clearly, God's speaking. Elohim speaks. He's in the spirit. He's in the man. And God just went to a fellow, found somebody sleeping by Jacob, said, wake up, I'm the God of this land. I have something for you to do. And the man could hear him speaking because the spirit of God had to live upon and entered him and God is in his spirit. This is a teaching you can't find in Judaism. But you can find it from Elijah. Yeah, God's stories are always based on actual events and are used for many purposes, such as conveying his teachings and establishing religious beliefs. In this story of the account of the night Jacob wrestled with a man and divine beings, Elohim said Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And Jacob says, I have seen a divine being face to face, yet my life has been preserved. So he didn't really prevail. Let's just say he survived. And the divine beings of God and the Holy Spirit. And so when it says Jacob said he had seen a divine being, and yet he only saw the man, because you can't see God and the angel of his presence. We cannot see the unseen realm of God, the elements that it consists of. They had no form or image. Jacob saw a host of the Lord's host. And believed him to be a man and also a divine man. But here's a real good one. And you can't find this in Judaism. It's just three verses and any interpretation they have is wrong. Because they don't recognize the Holy Spirit as a person. They don't know what a man and divine beings is. And it's how God communicates with the world. Every single prophet was a man in divine banks. Moshe, a man in divine banks. I'm a man in divine banks. But that doesn't make me an angel. I promise you, I'd be the last person you would associate as angelic. Not with my history. And here's, where, here's those three verses. The account of a man who identified himself to Joshua as a Gentile and a captain of the Lord's host in the book of Joshua, is the first and only time the scripture describes a host of the Lord's host. The captain of the Lord's host is clearly a host. Why only one time? How come Isaiah 63 is the only time you see the phrase, angel of his presence, and Holy Spirit? Isaiah 63. How come it's not in the Torah? When God said, I sent my angel before you, don't disobey him. My name is in him. Why didn't he give a little clarification of that? And this that I'm about to read to you. It's, it's my proof. He hid it. It's what he did. He knew they wouldn't find it. And they wouldn't understand it. It's very really cryptic. And that's what Isaiah 53 is. That is the craftiest writing of all time. And of course, I'm going to get to Isaiah 53. Okay, picking back up, I 
camera will only take a half an hour um, at a time. And I can't get it on the screen. Okay, let me find out where I was. Okay, number four. No, still on number three, a host. The accountable man who identified himself to Joshua as a Gentile and captain of the Lord's host in the book of Joshua is the first and only time the scripture describes the host of the Lord's host. And I mentioned that and the fact that it wasn't put into the talk. And if you don't believe the Holy Spirit, the angel of God's presence, is a person, you never get it. And Judaism doesn't. And this is how God communicates with the world. Spirit enters into a man. God is in the spirit. The man can now hear God speak. And he can hear the spirit speak, by the way. So, once, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing before him, drawn sword in hand. Joshua went up to him and asked him, are you one of us, an Israelite, or of our enemies? He replied, No, I am captain of the Lord's host. Now I have come. Okay, so he's not an Israelite, he's a Gentile. Right after that, that's what we find out. Joshua threw himself face down to the ground and prostrating himself said to him what does my lord command his servant well the captain of the lord's host answered joshua remove your sandals from your feet for the place where you stand is holy and joshua did so so let's think about that joshua threw himself to the ground before man with a drawn sword that he just told him that he was not an Israelite. And he said, what does my Lord command his servant? Well, man said he was a captain, a captain of the Lord's house. He didn't say he was a Lord. And the captain answered us, remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy. These are the exact words God said to Moses at the burning bush. God is with this man, and he's speaking through him. God can speak through the man that his spirit is in it, and God is in his spirit. He can, he can use the man, because he can control your thoughts. He can control your words and your physical movement. God is with the captain, and where God is, so is the angel of his presence, a man and a divine being. Is what? He's a host of the Lord's host. He's hosting the Lord. He's hosting the Lord and the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit. He's the host. Come and be my guest. Take me and have me do whatever it is you need done. And the captain said, now I have come. And he's never mentioned in the scripture again. He is a harbinger. Of Moshe, God's righteous servant, a harbinger. And what is he? He's a Gentile. Gentile man and divine being, so is Moshe, described in Isaiah 53. And that would be me, every verse. God orchestrated my life for 50 years to make sure I fit every verse. A man of suffering, familiar with disease, wounds. I'll get to that.
But he didn't speak to me until I was 50. And he did, he wanted me to be an atheist. He didn't want me to believe in God. He steered me away from it, is what he tells me. And did a good job. Because I was adamant about it. I didn't have anything to do with religious people, religious affiliation, churches, synagogue, anything. Now, I had Jewish friends, but they were like me. They, they just didn't have anything to do with God. Just wasn't part of uh, who we were. We just all went through bad times. It was just hard to believe anybody was up there, you know, pulling for us and things like that. Uh, but he wanted me to be a blank slate, a blank canvas where he could, you know, paint the knowledge he wanted me to have so that I could deliver these messages that I'm delivering. So he's a harbinger of the righteous servant. And, you know, that's the Gentile who will rise in the time to come of the prophecy of Jeremiah 31 in the day of the Lord. And I'm getting there. Isaiah 63 says God comes from Adam. That is interpreted in Judaism to be Christianity. Adam was in uh, what is Jordan today. It's Gentile lands. It's where Elijah got taken up. I mean, he was over... Yeah, um, he was east of the river Jordan. He was in Gentile lands when he got taken up. Elijah's a Gentile. He's an inhabitant of Ramoth Gilead. Which is Arab uh, and Assyrian. Well, they always were fighting over. It's Arab lands, east of the river Jordan. Ramoth Gilead. And he's a Tishbite. You can't find any Tishvites in any of the genealogies of the tribes that we have. You know, in Chronicles, Kings, uh, Samuel, you can, it's just not there. There's no Tishvites. And he's always referred to as Elijah, the Tishvite, an inhabitant. He lives in Ramoth Gibeah. He's a Gentile. And, and, again, I'm all for the righteous servants. I'm Elijah also. A Gentile. The harbinger, a Gentile, God's righteous servant. I'm reading it to you right now. A Gentile. He comes from Adam. God does. And, and he's got to have a visible representation. He's got to have a Moses. I'm the prophet like Moses. He's got to have a Moses. His visible representation. Moses, go tell the Israelites this. And uh, also, you better write it down. Write the Leviticus down. You're not going to tell them all that. He doesn't say God told him to write it down, but we have it, so he must have told him to write it down. God dictated everything I'm reading to you. This, this comes from the book, Isaiah 53, in the day of the Lord. The first book, he's had me write two. It's about 285 pages worth. It's not just Isaiah 53. It's all this information, too. And it's got everything you ever want to know about Isaiah 53. Finally, somebody who knows how to interpret it. And it would, and the only way you can interpret it, you have to be that man. It's written like that. It's crafty writing. God had Isaiah write like that. And it's, it's also a snare for the Christians with the words that he uses. Uh, the only thing that comes in second to it is Malachi 3. Okay, this would be uh, number four of the top ten. God's return in this day of the Lord. It's here. You should be looking... For Elijah, and most particularly Elijah, since he clears the way for the Lord. And if he's not successful in his purpose, which is the same purpose that might prosper of Isaiah 53. You know, Isaiah 53 is representing Elijah more than anybody. If you had to pick somebody, but you got to have a guy today. I mean, clearly, the original Elijah uh, and uh, David or Moses, they're not coming back. Prophet like Moses, okay. What did Moses do? He wrote and spoke God's words to the Jewish people, the Israelites. This is what I'm doing. And David brings the reckoning and dismissal, by the way. 
with the covenant of friendship. He, he doesn't clear the way, Elijah does. Judaism got that wrong. And why? Ram, Bam, King Moshe. King Moshe must build the temple, and then we will know it's truly him. Now, now you're going to know it from this. If say you to recognize who I am brings you nothing but trouble, your glory will be hurled to the ground. That's from 63, chapter 63 of Isaiah. And in Malachi 3, God brings utter destruction to the land if that temple's not built. That's clearing the way for him. So, this is God's return in this day of the Lord. How do we know this is the day of the Lord? Again, Judaism, I, I've never heard anybody in Judaism, any rabbi, speak of what I'm about to tell you. This is how we know. It begins with Jeremiah 31. When God says, see a time is coming, three times, summarizing, summarizing those, the land blooms again. The cities are restored and Jerusalem is rebuilt to a size at least as large as in antiquity. And it's a major metropolitan area today, much larger than anything in antiquity. Jerusalem is rebuilt to at least its size uh, it is today. And see a time is coming, God will make a new covenant with you. That's the covenant of sin forgiveness that begins, I will make a new covenant with you and write Torah on your hearts. How does he write Torah on your hearts? He forgives all your sins. What else does that do? Makes you a holy seed. When did he do this before? For the exiles. Assyrian Babylon exiles. He forgave their sins. Isaiah wrote those. Jeremiah writes it for the dispersal, the Roman dispersal. Isaiah wrote it for the exiles. And what did they do? They built the second temple. What do we know? We need another temple. This new covenant of sin forgiveness makes the Jews a holy seed again today, in this day of the Lord, to build the third temple, an eternal temple. Never be defeated and dispersed again. It won't be destroyed. So the land lay desolate after uh, Rome destroyed Jerusalem and basically the promised land and executed hundreds of thousands of Jews. They fled, fled primarily to Europe. And the land lay desolate for over 2,000 years. And Jeremiah's talking about, well, the land's got to bloom again. And the city's restored, Jerusalem rebuilt. What's he saying? When y'all come back, I come back. When you come back, I'm going to come back. That's all it is to it. You don't have to have sin. Yeah, a lot of rabbis say, uh, we all have to be sin free. Or it's the next mitzvah. So you've got to have a lot of observant Jews that brings God. No. All you got to do is return. He comes with sin forgiveness. Why do you have to all be sinless? And observant Jews, you don't. Why does he have somebody making everybody righteous? And you know what that is? If you're sin free, that's me telling you, honor God for, for just clearing your slate of any sins. Honor him and you come back to Judaism or you come to it for the first time, return to synagogue. Show God how much you appreciate him coming to live with you again and forgiving all your sins and putting his house amongst you eternally, promising you, you will never be defeated dispersed again. No longer be the taunts of nations. No, it's not utopia. It's not heaven on earth. And the scripture does it. To the extent you can find a story like they shall turn their swords into plowshares. That's just for the people of antiquity. They couldn't read. They're ignorant. They like stories read to them. They need to have hope in their lives too. And God would write some, he, he'd have his prophets write some things like that. But there's nothing from God. If you want to hear what God says, it's his covenant of friendship. And all that's happened today. This is it. Started in 1948 when the Jews returned and created Israel. 
The land does blend today. It's incredibly beautiful. It's incredible what they can do with water. <laughs> and uh, the cities, new, vibrant. Um, as a country, they rank in the top ten in everything you want a country to be. And just about any survey you see. A happy, friendly people. But always, but always under the threat of destruction in the Middle East. So, this is a day, new covenant. Okay, where is it? Where is it? Where, where are we, how do we know it's here? Well, somebody's got an answer. Who announced the first covenant? Prophet like Moses. Who's the messenger that comes with the angel of the covenant that you desire? There's only two, the one you, and one comes with David. The other comes, that's the angel of the covenant you desire. It's the covenant of sin and forgiveness of Jeremiah 31. Who else is there? Elijah, the messenger. Now what else do we know? Elijah's going to know the angel because he's been in heaven for over 2,000 years. He delivers it. And of course, again, he's just one of four righteous servants, all of which, all of which I am. I'm all four. This basically means I handle his role as messenger, and it's in the books. i got to get them published. And when they're published, the message is delivered. You're sin free. And, of course, when God comes, also contrary to the Messianic era, God says, I'm coming with vengeance. I pass the cup of my wrath, the bowl of reading from you, my people, to those who told you to get down on the ground and walk all over you. That would be Christianity who took your book and told you you didn't know how to read it. He comes with vengeance. He doesn't come to affect the world. He doesn't come to have the world speak Hebrew. Ramban misinterpreted that. Another error by the sages and rabbis. Well, by the rabbis anyway. So where is this covenant? So anyway, since we know the new covenant is here, we go to Malachi 3. That's the next time we see it. And that is where the day of the Lord is announced. God says, I'm sending my messenger before me to clear the way, and I'm going to return to my temple suddenly, just as soon as it's built. Suddenly, and the angel of the covenant you desire is on the way. So that's where you go. That's how you know this is the day of the Lord, and that see a time is coming three times means the time he's referring to is the day of the Lord. It seems so simple. Judaism doesn't get it. They don't teach it. Well, the rabbis who were dismissed, I bring the reckoning. I'm David. And they are dismissed. I'm the only shepherd, a teacher, God recognizes. That means they don't go into the scroll of remembrance. That means they don't go to the heaven that God is creating with the name Israel shall endure. The only way they're going to get out from being dismissed, they're going to have to teach the same things I'm teaching, which is what I'll be doing. That's how I'm a shepherd. I'm going to be teaching, teaching these matters of the two books God dictated to me. They're going to have to do it themselves. They're going to have to tell the flock, we've had ten fallacies that really, really, God is unhappy with, particularly the Messianic era. He never said anything like that. False teachings. But they're going to have to teach these matters if they want to uh, remove themselves from being dismissed and get entered into the scroll of remembrance. And that's even acknowledging that they're sin-free and that they're observant Jews. doesn't matter. They fall in with those who do not heed and revere the Lord. And they're going to have to prove they do by teaching these books. By the way, you can find them at Keith McCarty, McCarty.wordpress.com. And I've got a YouTube uh, video on every single chapter from both books. It's about 45, about 45 YouTube uh, chapters, but there's 50 chapters in the first book and 16 in the second book. Okay, and I just mentioned, who does the angel give the covenant to for delivery? Well, it's the messenger Elijah. That's why he said, God says, I'm sending my messenger to clear the way before me. So 
So who does not fear? Every verse of Isaiah 53 to be God's visible representation in this day of the Lord that will clear the way for him by having the third temple built for his return to dwell amongst his people forever and deliver the last two covenants. Jesus and the Jewish people as Israel, which is the common teaching in Judaism today that Isaiah 53 describes the Jewish people as Israel. Those two don't even enter into the conversation because Isaiah 53 is God's visible representation in the day of the Lord. And of course, Judaism doesn't know that. Jews for Judaism certainly doesn't. They believe in this Messianic era, this utopia on earth. That's what they base their, their, their reasoning on, the grounds for their argument that 53 is Israel, based on something that's never going to happen. Based on Rambam's words, not God's. And Toby is senior of Outreach Judaism. He says, verse 10, <laughs> where it says, God chose to crush this man with disease, that he would offer himself for guilt. And I'm going to get to that. I mean, he just, he just flew off the handle and said, that's a guilt offering. Let's go to Leviticus. He, he, he went the Christian route. Let's go to human sacrifice. And he, none of it makes any sense. It's an absolute absurdity. And I got plenty of writings on it. But basically he said everybody murdered, murdered in the Holocaust were a guilt offering. A guilt offering, which is for like uh, destroying religious objects or not paying a debt, debt something like that. Uh, of, a, of a ram. And of course they were all blemished. I mean at least the Christ, Christians said they got the unblemished lamb of God. Well he can't be in there either because he's crushed with disease. He's familiar with disease. He can't be in Isaiah 53. Anyway. Oh. And uh, see you Christians? Guess what? He's a Gentile. There's a harbinger of him, the captain of the Lord's host. He's a Gentile. And God comes from Adam, Gentile lands, and of the peoples, no Jew is with him. He comes with the Gentile. Jesus is a Jew. Mushiach of Isaiah 11, described in Isaiah 53, is a Gentile. A shepherd. Verse 5, and this is the last one I'm going to get to for this tape. I'm going to get, half, I'm going to get uh, 5 of the first 10. This has to do with these phrases in Isaiah 53. Remember I told you how crafty it's written. This was to draw the Gentiles in. God knew they were going to create a Jesus. And he also knew whether they did or not, they were going to take your book. Just as the Muslims uh, just plagiarized it. Wouldn't it because of our sins? What is that? Julian does not recognize the connection between Isaiah 53 and the books of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Malachi. Or understand that Isaiah 53 describes a man for the day of the Lord, God's visible representation, speaking and writing his words as Moses did. Judaism today teaches that God's righteous servant is the Jewish people as one man, Israel. As I just mentioned, based on faulty arguments, fallacies, regarding the Holocaust and the guilt offering, and the Messianic era, which will never occur. It's Rambam's word. It's not God's word. It's actually absurd when you read what Rambam says to think that's going to happen. That's the first thing I have on this videotape. You think the world's going to turn into that and the world's going to be solely to know God and everybody's going to be perfected, there'll be no sin, everybody speaks Hebrew, uh, food will be for everybody, delicacy, such, such as the dust itself. I mean, you're just making stuff up. Isaiah 53, 5 reads, But he was wounded because of our sins. 
crushed because of our iniquities. He bore the chastisement that made us whole. And by his bruises, we were healed. This is the crafty writing. What does that mean? Judaism doesn't believe there's vicarious suffering because God says every man is responsible for his own sin. No other man can die or take it for him. And they're clear on that, and especially if you ask them about Jesus, there wasn't that couldn't that, that can't happen. Well, that human sacrifice can't happen. God's not a God. He's not a man God, an Aztec God, that would commit, <laughs> commit human sacrifice, much less accept it. The book of Ezekiel, and I promise you, Judaism doesn't have a clue about this, and you can't really know if you're not the man going through it. Here's the answer. The book of Ezekiel is the key to understanding Isaiah 53. Ezekiel is told he will bear the punishment for the sin. I mean, that's what the punishment would be for. It doesn't say for sin, but you can see how these same words, wounded for our sins, start getting built in. Ezekiel is told he will bear the punishment of the houses of Israel and Judah, and he is punished, chastised, maltreated, bruised, and crushed. These are the words of Isaiah 53. It's not just verse 5. To make him suitable to be a prophet to the Assyrian Babylon exiles and speak the words of God he has given during the ordeal and the anguish of it. It is to remove his self-will and make him humble to God and the Jewish people. And it's done in God's power and his words. Just like the righteous servant, except Ezekiel is not crushed with disease and does not make himself an offering for guilt. God just seizes him. This is what Ezekiel says. And by the way, I call it God's boot camp. And he will hurt you. He, he'll maltreat you. He'll hurt your feelings. He'll draw emotion and anger from you all day long. Just to change you, break your will, make you humble. Um... Like I said, it's like a boot camp. It's like uh, breaking a wild horse. I mean, you know, they beat on a wild horse until he stops bucking. You know, it's being a Marine in a boot camp and having a sergeant who's allowed to beat you with a big stick if he wants to. And who can read your mind, by the way. Here's what Ezekiel said. A spirit seized me, and I went in the bitterness and fury of my spirit in the hand of God. Now he's in the hand of God. Why is he bitter and furious? Because when God punishes, maltreats, chastises, bruises, and crushes you, doesn't matter that it's God. You're furious and you're bitter. I mean, he's very good at these things. And again, he's just changing. It's for he, he'll tell you what's for you. <laughs> Of course, I always got some kind of argument that I don't care to have it. Thank you. <laughs> I, I don't want it. He says you need it. And here's what God says to Ezekiel. I will make your face as hard as theirs. Something about the, the, the Jewish people, the Israelites. I will make your face as hard as theirs and your forehead as brazen as theirs. I will make your forehead like adamant Harder than flint, do not fear them, and do not be dismayed by them. And then God maltreats and punishes him for the punishment of the house of Israel and Judah for their sins. For 430 days he is pinned to the ground with the power of God, binding, binding his arms behind his back as though with handcuffs. For 390 days on one side. He's not allowed to flip over to the other side. I can't get through a night without flipping over. 390 days for the punishment of the house of Israel and 40 more days for the punishment of the house of, of Judah. Now, he's a priestly man. Do you know how mad you would be to know you're getting punished for the sins of the people you've been trying to stop sinning? You're holding. So he's pinned to the ground, which was called bruising and crushing, by the way. 
God's power continued to the ground. He showed me. He pinned me down for five days one time because I, um, let's say I sassed him. <laughs> let's say I said something. I got angry and I yelled at him. He said he wants me to tell you. He, I said, he was so mad. He said, Keith, I am God. And I said, God, I am Keith. <laughs> and his invisible power slammed me to the ground with such force it just about knocked me unconscious. And I didn't get to get up except for the bathroom and eating for five days. He did take me on very interesting visions, but uh, just slammed me to the ground. It's not that it wasn't the last time he slammed me to the ground. And usually he'll do it when you least expect it. Now he did it to me then. And I should have expected it. But usually he'll just do it when everything just seems fine and nice and things are going pretty good. And just out of nowhere, slam you to the ground. Yeah, it hurts your feelings. That's maltreatment. But that's what all these words are about in 53. God's boot camp. And he does it. He does it in his power. Which envelops me. I mean, I always know, you know, and there's a heaviness around me and my body. You know, I don't just hear his words. I mean, I know he's right here with me. So for 430 days, pinned to the ground, crushed and bruised, eating nothing but bread, chastised by the words of God. Um, there, there's one example of that. The Assyrian Babylonian exiles were made whole and healed only if they listened to him. The teachings of Ezekiel of repentance and restitution. God, God's righteous servant, which he is made, is wounded, crushed, and chastised by the world, based on the verses, throughout his life with persistent hardships and troubles grievously affected, especially by disease, and severely injured at one time or another. A man of many bruises and scars, stripes. These are the qualities that identify him as God's righteous servant who makes the many righteous as a man of suffering familiar with disease. None of which was described as Jesus, by the way. None of it. I mean, I'm the antithesis of Jesus. You know, my atheist, I've been through all these troubles, been through all these wounds. I've been uh, shot through the abdomen. Uh, I've had three cancers, skin cancer, colon cancer, and lung cancer, which is my proof of 5310. I offer for myself for guilt. I'm going to read this to you first and then follow up on that. My proof that I did do and offer myself for guilt, because it says God chose to crush him with disease, that if he offers himself for guilt, he he will receive long life. I was told after I survived the colon cancer that uh, it had spread to my lungs. They gave me about one month to live, said it was untreatable, there's nothing they could do, it's too advanced. I said, you know, I said, what does all that mean? You're not going to treat it? They said, no, you're just going to die and you're going to die soon. And that was when the planes hit New York. 20 years ago, and I've never seen a doctor since. I walked out of there and I never came back. No treatment, nothing. I was crushed with sleep, crushed my life. I quit working everything, just waiting to die. And then I never died. I didn't get along with And he still hadn't spoken to me. I still didn't know about all this. He said, well, how did you offer yourself from guilt? He told me I did. He said, you would have if I had asked you, because you didn't even know what Isaiah, the book Isaiah was. And I needed to get started. He said, you, believe me, you're going to say yes. <laughs> and I would have, because it gave me a long life. I was just so I was going to die. But he didn't talk to me for about nine years after that. I guess that's about right. Well, I was like 41 or 43 years old, and I was 50 when he spoke to me. I'm 63 today. So, I, I've had this really rough and tumble life. Lots of all these things that, that fit into the verses. Then, to make me suitable for his purposes, 
God in his power and words punish me, chastise me, maltreating me, crush me, and bruise me in what we call the fire of refinement to make my face as hard as the Jewish people. Remember, I'm a Gentile. My forehead is brazen as theirs. My forehead like adamant. Basically meaning, you know, don't push me too far. <laughs> I'm a man of divine beings, but I'm still a man. As brazen as theirs, uh, harder than flint, so that I will not fear them. I won't be embarrassed to go in front of them and say, yeah, I'm a Gentile, and I am Moshe, and I am, described in Isaiah 53. And I am Elijah, and the prophet like Moses. In other words, you know, just go in and tell somebody that, you know, you got to be prepared for that. you gotta, you got to have your emotions under control, because you can imagine the responses I'm going to get. And it's already happened. What's one of the uh, second verse, I think, or third verse? He was shunned. Despise my man, accounted, <clears throat> played, etc., etc. See, nobody even thinks about that. Come, Moshe, come, the rabbis say. Which, you know, they're going to be dismissed in the regular way, so I don't know why they're calling on me. But um, it's like they've given no thought to those words. What, what does it mean? Well, they say, well, 53 is not Moshe. Well, yes, he is. The anointed one. Well, what's the anointed of in 11? Well, we're going to find out to 53. To make the many branches. And as it turns out, many other tasks. So, and how does he do that? Well, he breaks me. Just like a wild horse. Just like a cadet. To be right. He just breaks you down. It's relentless. He doesn't sleep, which means I don't get to sleep much. This has been going on 13 years. It started out fairly slow, but every year it's gotten more intense. As he says, it just takes more to anger you. It takes more to hurt your feelings because you're ready for everything now. He says, I've got to be, I gotta be more extreme. It's been a tough time. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure everybody would like to live with God and the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit. Uh, but it's not near as much fun as you think. <laughs> you wouldn't pass it up. And he'd always say I'm the luckiest person, you know, of all times, or at least since the Bible closed. But, uh, you know, I've been for death a thousand times, and I've cursed him a thousand times. And God says, and Keith, you did it face to face. Which is just him directing me in his power to a place in the room where he says, this is where my presence is for us to talk today. That's face to face, friend to friend. And friend to friend, what does that mean? I can say anything I want. Unless I cross the line and all of a sudden I slam to the ground. You gotta be a little careful. He's pretty forgiving. And again, it's to remember myself well. I don't make any decisions. I'm not responsible for anything. He controls my thoughts, my words, my physical movement. Okay, I'm going to pick up on uh, what I believe to be number six. I don't have it numbered uh, on, on another video because this has already gone over an hour. Uh, and number six is Isaiah 53 is a story of righteousness. And it's, it's very good. It, it, it follows up on all these, uh, this, this God's boot camp and the, the fire of refinement. It, it clarifies it even more as to... You know, why Isaiah 53? It's not some song. That's what, that's, that's what Judaism teaches. It's a song. So, by the way, all that started with a Christian. But uh, uh, regarding the Jewish people and what they've been through in their history. But none of it works. In other words, it's an absurdity. It's ridiculous. And I find it hard to believe that people like Michael Skoback, Jews for Judaism, Toby Singer, Outright Judaism, I find it hard to believe they truly believe their own words because their arguments are fallacies. They're absolutely absurdities. And uh, God, God put them in the book. He dictated what he wanted me to say, what he wanted uh, to say about what they do and what they teach and how they teach it and how many errors and problems and uh, lack of reasoning. That would really be totally a signal. 
uh, that they exhibit. Uh, it's his writings. So if you, you see the YouTube and I'm saying all these things, they're coming straight from God through me. That's where they come from. That's his opinion of them, not mine. Although I have to admit, after reading the reasoning and their arguments and seeing how uh, many fallacies, these top ten in Judaism, uh, I'm not that impressed with them. I'm not impressed, you know, and I was an atheist for 50 years. But I'm not impressed with them. But, you know, I have to remember, God taught me a blank slate, a blank canvas, a painting of uh, how he wants me to understand him, his spirit, the unseen realm, and his creation and his people. Everything in my life is about the Jewish people. And uh, I'm still not clear if he's going to have, sometimes he tells me I'm going to convert Orthodox in Jerusalem. And sometimes he says I'm still thinking about it. Which is ridiculous because he doesn't do that. He always knows exactly what's going to happen. So he's just kind of leaving me dangling a little bit. You know, I'm not on the executive committee. You know, I, I, I don't get in on, hey, let's, let's do this. I, I don't offer those kind of things. He tells me what we're going to do from waking up to going to sleep to what I'm going to eat to what I'm going to read, to what I'm going to watch on TV, uh, to what I'm going to do during the day. I don't control anything. So I'll be picking up with Isaiah 53. It's a story of righteousness. And that'll be, uh, it'll be YouTube volume, uh, the details, uh, two of two of the top ten fallacies of Judaism. Thanks for listening. This is the second of two videos covering uh, the top ten fallacies of Judaism. This picks up with uh, number six. Isaiah 53 is a story of righteousness. It is not a song, as is taught in Judaism, of the history of the Jewish people. The witnesses of the first six verses of Isaiah 53 are sick with guilt from not following God's law and not being righteous. And they're in quotes. Verse 1 begins with a quote, and that quote ends at the end of verse 6. That combines everybody in those six verses as uh, a similar people, same people. They're sick with guilt, and so, for not being righteous, and the man goes through this fire of refinement with God, God's boot camp which I mentioned in, uh, at the end of the uh, first video of two on the top ten fallacies of Judaism. He goes through this fire refinement for them to become God's righteous servant who makes them many righteous. An example is, he was wounded for our sins. He is. But not in the sense Christians believe in some sort of human sacrifice. He is wounded by God in the power of God to make him humble to God and the Jewish people, to take his self-will from him. And to, so that he'll be suitable um, to God for God's purposes as a prophet. To remove, to remove the fury as his spirit. Which we, we saw Ezekiel say, I went in bitterness and the fury of my spirit in the hand of God. And we know Moses had the same kind of temperament. His story pretty much begins with he became so angry at a man that he killed him. And getting into fights. And to be presentable, to go to those who are sinning 
and who are sick from it, sick with guilt, in these first six verses. They are the many made righteous. See, it's a story. I mean, he's, he's pretty much like them. But he rises to the crown of, of, of God's righteous servant. Through this fire of refinement. That's how he's prepared. And taught at the same time. Taught the scripture. And bring them to observant Judaism, which removes their guilt. And that's what Isaiah 53 tends about. He offered himself for guilt. Offered myself to go to the fire of refinement. To go to them and remove their guilt. Okay, just because I went through the fire of refinement does not remove their guilt. This is reality. This is the real world. It's because it's God's righteous servant. If they recognize me, and that's how the first verse starts. Who can believe our report? Who has the arm of the Lord been revealed on? Okay, that means they recognize me, believe who I am. And once they hear my story and understand how poorly Judaism has interpreted Isaiah 53, and that God is literally... Literally with me. His spirit entered into me and God is in his spirit. That makes them want, you know, believe again. And, and I come with a covenant of sin forgiveness. That is delivered in my capacity as Elijah. And really all I'm telling them is, you're sin free. You can, your guilt's gone. I offer myself for your guilt. And that's what it really means. It, 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 it's almost like, um, well, I was going to say metaphors, but it's not a metaphor. It's just, well, I'll come back to that. That is why he offers himself to God for guilt, emotional guilt of those who are not righteous, that he's going to make righteous because they're going to believe in him. And that God is here. God is doing what he said he's going to do. And you're sin free. Get back to observant Judaism. Or come to observant Judaism. If you've never been. Honor God. He's cleared your slate. He's made you a holy seed. To place his temple amongst you. Forever. You'll never be defeated. And uprooted. And dispersed again. The fire of refinement. And and so, you know, I've gone through the fire of refinement. And now I'm going to make the many righteous. Those who believe in me. Based on these proofs. My knowledge and the two books that God dictated to me as he dictated the Torah to Moses. That's the proof. That my knowledge of heaven as Elijah. Isaiah uh, 53 was written in such a manner that you cannot put it together if you are not going through it. No one ever has. God had it written that way by Isaiah. You can't figure it out. And you don't even realize Ezekiel goes through the same thing. That's the go-by that God put, in, put into the Tanakh. To show you, this is this is how it's been done before. These are the same words being used. Ezekiel is punished for what? Well, ultimately for the sins of the houses of Judah and Israel. That's what he's told. Uh, but but really, what's happening is God's just making him angry, making him furious and bitter, being told he's got to suffer their their, their punishment. <clears throat> it's not really what's going on. God's just preparing him. I have been in God's fire refinement for 13 years. He spoke to me when I was 50 and I'm 63 today. <clears throat> During which he taught me the scripture and how to interpret Isaiah 53 and its association with the day of the Lord. You can find these two books, Isaiah 53 and the day of the Lord at KeithMcCartyMcCarty.wordpress.com. And the second book, and this book was, was written so you can see how my life 
fits me into the verses of Isaiah 53. It's called the life of God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53 at the same word press site. It's my life. But he dictated it to me. He said, this is what I won't put down. And, and basically, again, it's to show you who I am, but it's also to show you how I fit the verses. And it goes about seven chapters, that are, or six chapters that are my life from birth. And then in chapter seven, it's called God Speaks to an Atheist. And then from seven to 16, you see, you see the fire of fire. It's, it's me and God and the Spirit in me, and God's in the Spirit. And so the rest of the book is just uh, the last 13 years. And I am the only man who has ever lived, including Jesus, that fits every verse. God orchestrated my life to be sure of it, to be a man of suffering, familiar with disease and affliction and disease, well, crushed with disease. Okay, the day of the Lord. Judaism, this would be number seven of the top ten fallacies of Judaism. <coughs> Judaism teaches that in the Messianic era, the world is perfected and sin removed. Basically, utopia, heaven on earth. In the day of the Lord, he comes not to destroy sinners, remove sin, or require repentance, but to forgive the Jewish people. He comes with the covenant of sin forgiveness. The Jewish people, make so there will be a holy seed to build the third temple. Just as he forgave the Assyrian Babylon exiles, making them a holy seed, and they built the second temple. The term day of the Lord appears in the books of Isaiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Amos, Abadiah, Zephaniah, and finally in the last book of the prophets, Malachi. In Ezekiel and Zechariah, the day of the Lord is said to be only against the nations, which would be the Gentiles, nations of the Gentiles, and in Obadiah against Adam and Esau, which as we've seen previously, Christianity, Adam, and the nations. The prophets warn that the day of the Lord is near. But it is not the end of the world. The wicked and sinners will be punished and justice established. This is Isaiah chapter 13 verse 9. Lo, the day of the Lord is coming with pitiless fury and wrath to make the earth a desolation, to wipe out the sinners upon it. It doesn't sound like going out and perfecting the world by Moshe to accept the Jews as having always been right about God all along. This is Ezekiel chapter 30, verses 3 through 5. For a day is near, a day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of cloud, an hour of invading nations. A sword shall pierce Egypt, and Nubia shall be seized with trembling. When men fall slain in Egypt, and her wealth is seized, and her foundations are overthrown, Nubia, Put, and Lud, and all the mixed populations, and Cub, and the inhabitants of the allied country shall fall by the sword with them. This is Joel chapter 2, verse 12 through 13. Yet even now, says the Lord, turn back to me with all your hearts, and with fasting, weeping, and lamenting. Rend your hearts rather than in your garments, and turn back to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in kindness, and renouncing punishment. This is Joel chapter 
3 verse 5. But everyone who invokes the name of the Lord shall escape, for there shall be a remnant on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, as the Lord promised. Anyone who invokes the Lord will be among them, uh, among the survivors. This is Amos chapter 5 verse 12. For I have noted how many are your crimes and how countless your sins. You enemies of the righteous, you takers of bribes, you who subvert in the gate the cause of the needy, assuredly. At such a time, the prudent man keeps silent, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that ye may live, and that the Lord, the God of hosts, may truly be with you as you think. Hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. Perhaps the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. This is Obadiah, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Thus said the Lord God concerning Adam, Christianity. I will make you least among the nations. Ye shall be most despised. Your arrogant heart has seduced you. You who dwell in clefts of the rock, in your lofty abode, you think in your heart, who can pull me down to earth? Should you rest as high as the eagle? Should your eyrie be lodged among the stars? I will pull you down, declares the Lord. Zephaniah chapter 1, 14 through 18. And I will bring distress upon men, that they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord, and their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as dung. Zechariah uh, chapter 14, verses 12 through 17. And for those peoples that warred against Jerusalem, the Lord will smite them. With this plague, their flesh shall rot away while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall rot away in their sockets, and their tongues shall rot away in their mouths. Okay. These are examples of writing for the people of antiquity and the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages. That appears to be prophecy. But in the age of reason and information, we know will never occur. Very entertaining and believed by the masses who could not read and had never been to school in antiquity in the Middle Ages. Good, fearsome stories. They have nothing to do with the day of the Lord and God's final words on the subject for a time to come as announced in Jeremiah 31 of the New Covenant completely changes, has nothing to do with wiping out evil, sinners being destroyed, horrible plagues put on people, and it has nothing to do with perfecting the world. It has to do with sin forgiveness of his people and the building of the third temple. It comes with sin forgiveness. He's not coming to destroy sinners. Completely changes. The earth... And it's his final word. It's the last thing he talks about with the prophets before he starts speaking to the prophets. Malachi 3 brings a new concept to the day of the Lord. It is God's final word on the day that he is preparing where a scroll of remembrance will be written at his behest concerning those who revere the Lord and esteem his name. He does not address the nations, the Gentiles, but only Israel and its people. To them come back to return to my temple that I'm going to place amongst you eternally. You'll no longer be the taunts of nations. You'll never be defeated and dispersed again. The lamb will bloom. I'll bring the rain.
and sin forgiveness. In the day of the Lord, he comes with his messenger, Elijah, and the angel of the new covenant of sin forgiveness. Not to destroy sinners or require their repentance, but to forgive them and give them another chance. That would be just his people. The scroll of remembrance, you have to be entered into it to go to the heaven that he is creating for the name Israel to endure. The rabbis have been dismissed. By my, by my uh, arriving, reckoned with and dismissed. They don't go into the scroll of remembrance until they teach and straighten Judaism out the way the scripture says it is. Instead of these fallacies, these faulty arguments, these bad commentaries, this lack of reasoning and uh, and thought about, about how the Bible's written. It's written for two different sets of people. Antiquity in the Middle Ages, in the age of reasoning, of science, of medicine, of information, of the internet. You can't rely on what the sages and rabbis said. And he changes it. He had all those horrible verses about the day of the Lord, this great Armageddon. But that's not what happens. He changes it right at the end. He says, well, now this, you know, for, for, for those who can think of their own and don't have to rely on sages and rabbis of antiquity, for those with reasoning abilities, for those who can make proper commentary and argument for what they want to say, contrary to this teaching that uh, the people of Israel are uh, God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53, instead of realizing that's the man that's going to be God's representation. He's going to be for righteous servants, and there's lots to do. And you have to have a description, even the sages knew that. The leper scholar, a man who's diseased, but is a scholar, very learned. Okay, well, as I mentioned, uh, I've gone through three uh, cancers. <clears throat> the last that was supposed to take my life 20 years ago, uh, but I'm also a lawyer. I am a scholar, and I'm most definitely a scholar of the prophets, the book of the prophets, of the Tanakh. I don't deal much with the Torah. God says, they've done all you can do with the Torah. <laughs> just nothing left. You don't even have to bother with it. I don't have anything to do with the Talmud, except when we need something, like like the verses that lead to the naming of the man by Isaiah 53, he's a leper scholar. But uh, I got too many other things to do. Rambam says, Mushiach will study Torah day and night. Uh, no, no. Okay, so in the day of the Lord, it's not to destroy sinners or require their repentance uh, because he forgives everybody. Okay, he also amends the first covenant, the covenant delivered by Moses. That's why it's a new covenant. Basically, it's just an amendment and an addition. That's the sin forgiveness. And here's the amendment. He amends the first covenant, Malachi 3, to be mindful of the teaching of my servant Moses, whom I charged at Oreb with laws and rules for all Israel, rather than strict compliance of the first covenant by, by all the Israelites. In Malachi 3, he, he shows you. Not everybody's going to heed him, even though that's what Jeremiah 31 says. Everybody shall heed me. Well, he, he's granting sin forgiveness. He, that's what you would expect. But we also know the reality is that's not going to happen. That's why there's also a scroll of remembrance. Those who heed and reveal him, and those who do not. So he's recognizing that despite how uh, the new covenant of sin forgiveness is written, and that everybody heeding him, and everybody will have Torah on the heart. Basically, you know what that means? Everybody's been has a clean slate. Everybody is sin free. But don't fall to the evil inclination. Get back to observant Judaism. I mean, 
I was supposed to make the many righteous. Well, they're all righteous. But they got to follow up on them. And they got to keep that slate clean. God knew in modern times of secularism and reliance on science, medicine, technology, that his righteous servant might not be recognized, believed, or heeded. Again, 53 has in it, he was shunned, despised, and kind of played. And that's already been going on with me for quite some time. And I'm sure it will continue for quite some time. So he says, though, if I'm not heeded and listened to, when he does come, which basically just means if you don't get my temple built, utter destruction is coming to the land. He says, I'm going to bring utter destruction, but he is his creation. What he means, it's just like raising up armies. He's saying Israel will be destroyed one day if you don't build this third temple and we don't make a lot of noise with the last prophet of God, the last messenger of God. You know, that's what the Muslims say about Muhammad. They even etch it in stone on their mosque. The last prophet, the last messenger of God. Well, he's not. And that's going to cause some noise, too. Because you're looking at the last prophet right here. And what else should you see if you use your imagination? The angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, has entered me, and God is in him. Okay, I think this is number eight of the top ten fallacies of Judaism. God, his angel, spirit, the Gentile Moshe, come from Adam. Gentile lands in this day of the Lord. Okay, this is going to explain better than I, <clears throat> uh, the previous uh, seven fallacies. How it is Adam is associated with Christianity and Gentile lands. Judaism does not teach that Moshiach comes with God from Gentile lands. Or that Moshiach is a Gentile. Well, you think anti-missionaries would really like to get their hands on. Because if you believe, and you should, that he's a Gentile, well, what do we know? Jesus is a Jew. He can't be the man by Isaiah 53. For many reasons. But that's just another one. It's part of the reason that uh, God comes with the Gentiles, as a matter of fact. Because he knew what the Gentiles were going to do. Who is this coming from Adam? In crimson garments from Basra. That, that was a, a city kind of like Jerusalem to Adam. That was their capital city. Majestic in attire, pressing forward in his great might, it is I to contend victoriously powerful to give triumph. Okay, that's God. And that's Isaiah chapter 63, verse 1. In the Talmud, Adam is described as the eternal enemy of Israel and Judah, who not only always oppressed Israel, but at the time of the destruction of the first temple, took advantage of the situation and seized control of parts of Judah. And it is hinted that Adam also took part in the destruction of Jerusalem and even in that of the temple itself. The overwhelming majority of homilies about Adam ex speak explicitly of Rome, Gentiles. It was stated that Rome was founded by the children of Esau, brother of Jacob, who was re, uh, Jacob, of course, renamed Israel, who were eternal anti antagonists against each other. Esau only married Gentile women. All of his children were Gentiles. The Hebrew word Adam means red. And the Hebrew Bible relates it to the name of the founder, Esau, the elder son of the Hebrew patriarch, Isaac, because he was born, quote, red all over. 
as a young adult, he sold his birthright to his brother Jacob for red pottage. The Tanakh describes the Edomites as descendants of Esau. These identifications occur in the Midrashim, which is the plural form of Midrash, and the Talmud, but also in the Palestinian Targums of the Torah, and in the Targums to Lamentations and Esther, Adam became a synonym for Christian Rome, and after the fall of Rome, to Christianity. The Targums are interpretive renderings of the books of the Hebrew Scriptures, uh, with the exception of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Daniel, uh, into Aramaic. Uh, such versions were needed when Hebrew ceased to be the normal medium of communication amongst the Jews. In synagogue services, the readings of the Scriptures was followed by a translation into the Arama Aramaic vernacular of the populace, uh, and that's from uh, Bruce M. Metzger, a rendering on the Jewish Targums. God says in 63 verse 3, I trod at a vintage, a vintage alone of the peoples, that's the Jewish people, no man was with me. That's how you know he comes with a Gentile. He's got to have his Moses, his visible representation speaking and writing his words. No man was with me. I trod them down in my anger, trampled them in my rage. Their life blood bespattered my garments and all my clothing was stained. Okay, picking back up. This is a reference to utter destruction to the land of Malachi 3. To the land of Malachi 3. If the purpose of Elijah does not prosper, that's clearing the way for the Lord. Because the Jewish people will not recognize his prophet. The Lord coming from Adam is mentioned by many of the prophets in the Bible. The Lord was not allowed to pass through Adam in the Exodus with Moses. They didn't. They wouldn't let him come through. They had to go around. And the Jewish people. The prophet, like Moses, with God, as God was with Moses in the Exodus, will come from Adam. The Christian world. Now the Jewish people none are with God. He comes with a Gentile from the, uh, from the Christian world, from Gentile lands. The nations. Number nine of the top ten fallacies of Judaism. The remnant of 13 tribes returned to Judah. The Talmud talks of, of ten lost tribes, and Judaism teaches that today. There were no lost tribes. All you got to do is just free Nehemiah and Israel. They make it clear. That's what the scripture says. The scripture says all 13 tribes. There's 12 tribes who were allotted lands of the promised land. But there's a 13th tribe. And that's the priestly tribe. And uh, they want allotted lands. Isaiah 52 is an announcement of prophecy fulfilled. This is 52. And this isn't taught correctly either. A prophecy fulfilled in the return to Jerusalem and Judah of a remnant of all 13 tribes from the Assyria Babylon exile. It's not just Babylon to build a second temple by decree of Cyrus of Persia, who of course was a Gentile, and he was a Moshe, anointed one. He was anointed to build God's temple. And what he did, he said, I don't release all the exiles of Assyria and Babylon. And uh, by decree, he told them to go to Jerusalem, if you desire, and rebuild God's house. 
the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh that settled outside the promised land east of the river Jordan, and the tribes of the northern kingdom of Samaria, also called uh, kingdom of Ephraim and kingdom of Israel, were defeated by the Assyrians and deported and deported, became the exiles to lands in Assyria, northwest of Babylon, which uh, is in Iraq, or would have been, and to the towns of Medea, that's Iran. The Assyrians imported, this is very important, they imported Gentiles to the lands of the northern kingdom. That's why when all the tribes came back, they all went to Judah. Gentiles had been imported to the northern kingdom. So they had to go to the southern kingdom. That's why they all went there. That doesn't mean the ten tribes who would make up most of the northern kingdom didn't come back. It's because they couldn't go there. The kingdom of Judah was defeated by the Babylonians and in stages deported to Babylon, again Iraq. Jerusalem is within the lands of Benjamin. Which lands are considered part of the kingdom of Judah, since that is where the kings of Judah <clears throat> rule from? The accounts of the return of the Jewish people by the decree of Cyrus of Persia, the first Gentile anointed one of God, Hamashiach, who had defeated the Chaldeans. And God mentions the Chaldeans by name who had defeated the Babylonians and formed the Persian Empire, including their lands, are in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah and in 1 Chronicles. Homoshea Cyrus addresses all the 13 tribes in his decree. This is in quotes. This is from 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 2. Thus said King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has charged me with building him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Any one of you of all his people, the Lord, his God, be with him and let him go up. Remnants of all the 13 tribes of Israel returned to Jerusalem and Judah. The tribes with allotments uh, in the northern kingdom could not return to those lands. Gentiles who had been imported to the lands of the northern kingdom were settled there, many of whom tried to stop the building of the second temple. This is Ezra chapter 3 verse 1. When the seventh month arrived, the Israelites being settled in their towns, the entire people assembled as one man. In Jerusalem. The Israelites. Well, if just Judah and Benjamin return, you can't say Israelites because Judah and Benjamin aren't the Israelites and cannot assemble as one man in Israel. They can't. All 13 tribes came back. When the people of Israel gather as one man, it is all 12 tribes and the Levites. The priestly tribe, the Levites is the priestly tribe. But it gets better. 1 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 2 and 3. The first to settle, and, and basically the tribes who had been in the northern kingdom, they had to go get land and settle their own homes and towns uh, in Judah. And uh, that would include Benjamin. The first who settled in their towns on their property were Israelites, priests, Levites, and temple servants, while some of the Judaites and some of the Benjamites and some of the Ephraimites and some of the Manassehites settled in Jerusalem. Well, right there, you can't say ten lost tribes because it says Manasseh and uh, Ephraim came back. They may get eight, eight tribes lost, four came back. But even more importantly is this. Ephraim and Manasseh 
were not lost tribes, as many believe from writings outside of the Hebrew Bible. It is said in writings by sages and rabbis that ten of the twelve tribes of Israel became lost and did not return to Judah to build the second temple. There never were lost tribes. The other problem with that is we have a false prophecy by Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 43, verses 5 through 6. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your folk from the east, will gather you out of the west. I will say to the north, give back. And to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. This is Isaiah. That's written for the exile. That's God saying, everybody come back right now. Isaiah prophecies to all the Assyrian Babylon exiles returning by the words of God. The return of the exiles to the land of Israel, given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by covenant and partitioned amongst the twelve. It is not just the Babylon exiles of Judah and Benjamin. It includes all the tribes. In Isaiah chapter 43, God says, verse 14, Thus said the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, For your sake I send to Babylon, I will bring down all her bars, and the Chaldeans, the Chaldeans shall raise their voice in lamentation. The Chaldeans defeated Babylon, and the Chaldeans were defeated by Assyria, and Assyria was defeated by Persia. It's not just Babylon exiles of Jews. I'm about to do something new. Even now it shall come to pass. Suddenly you shall perceive it. I will make a road through the wilderness and rivers in the desert. It is I, I, who for my own sake wipe your transgressions away and remember them no more. Sins of goodness. All 13 tribes. There are so many other verses where they gather <clears throat> as one man Israel, as Israelites. Again, that's all 13 tribes. And of course, this account in Isaiah is repeated in the book of Jeremiah for the Jewish people of the dispersal of the Roman Jewish revolts who return and the land blooms again and the ruined cities in Jerusalem are rebuilt. God's prophecy of a time to come that also includes sin and forgiveness. So, the time to come with Jeremiah 31 that began in 1948 when the state of Israel was created after the Holocaust. You know, Tucky Singer says, uh, the Jewish people as one man as one man were made a guilt offering under under the laws of Leviticus. But he only uses as his example the six men who were murdered. Murdered in the Holocaust. It's not all the people. I mean, again, his reasoning defies the imagination for such an intelligent man. A man with so much information, but his ability to reason is made, brought into sus sus extreme suspicion. In his analysis of Isaiah 53, 10, and as far as I'm concerned, his truthfulness. Because I can't believe he believes these things he's writing. It makes absolutely no sense. He's, all of a sudden he believes God is a God of human sacrifice? I mean, he's acknowledging to the Christians, okay, you're probably right, or you could be right, since our God does accept human sacrifice. But the bottom line is, that's not all the people of Israel. You can't say Isaiah 53 is all of the people assembled as the man of Israel, unless you got all of them. Okay, the final, <clears throat> the final of the ten, top ten fallacies of Judaism. Okay, the Spirit of God, aligning upon God's servant David, makes him 
the anointed one. That's what Moshiach means. Anointed one. Ha is, means the, so you can say Ha Moshiach, the anointed one. Okay? But it doesn't say anointed to do, to do what? What's he anointed for? God's anointment is not with oil. The anointment is with spirit. When the spirit alights upon you and enters you, that's the anointment. And God is in the spirit. But to do what? Okay, the spirit of God alighting upon the descendant of King David makes him the anointed one. There, as I said, to do what? It is to be God's righteous servant. That's where he's described, Isaiah 53. What does he do? He's anointed to make the many righteous. And it includes many other tasks. Because as it turns out, he's four righteous servants. God's righteous servant, Elijah, prophet like Moses, and Moshe. The descendant of King David. And that, you can find those descriptions in uh, Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 34 and 37, and Malachi 3. Descriptions of, of, of tasks that he's anointed for. Deliver covenants, clear the way for the Lord. Uh, one of the purposes of Elijah is to bring the Jewish families to or back to Judaism. Being mindful of the teachings of God gave Moses at Oreb of his laws and commandments for all Israel. Which, of course, is the amendment, and there's an inclusion. The new covenant never ended. I mean, the first covenant never ended. It's just an amendment with an addition of sin forgiveness. It's basically a confirmation. Amendment, confirmation, uh, supplementing, and, of course, mindful means not strict compliance. Makes it a little bit easier on those who, who just uh, can't be ultra-Orthodox. They just can't do it. It's just too much. Ultra-Orthodox can take that for what they want. Everybody's going to have to come up with their own, every branch of Judaism. What is meant by mindful? What does that mean? How does that change what we do right now? It's an affirmation and confirmation by declaration of God that he is the God of the Jewish people and the Jewish people are his chosen of all the earth. You know, Judaism doesn't teach anything on the day of the Lord. It completely conflicts with the Messianic era. They just simply do not go together. And Judaism doesn't teach of the day of the Lord um, or, or even, they don't even know that prophets are men and divine beings because they don't recognize the Holy Spirit as a person. As Moshe, as God's righteous servant, as Elijah, as a prophet like Moses, I am a man in the bound veins. And this is a, you know, it's, it's, those are all just names. Basically, God has come to me and said, I've got things for you to do. And, but i got to whip you into shape. I'm going to put you to fire or fire. My boot camp. I mean, it's great to hear those names. But they don't really mean much other than the fact I'm a man in the bound veins. And each of them was too. If you know what you're looking for, you'll find Moses was a man of divine beings. You'll find David was a man of divine beings. You will find Elijah was a man of divine beings. It's there. Once you know what to look for, you can find it. And, of course, I point them out in the book. That's all great names aside. Nothing gets done if you're not a man of divine beings because no man can do these things that, quote, Moshe is supposed to do. Much less God's righteous servant, Elijah, prophet like Moses. I mean, I can't write God's words if he doesn't tell me what to write down. You say, well, how could you use not know of these things? God didn't want you to know. It's my proof. 
It's my proof. Uh, so there's three persons with this, within this human body. But guess who's in control of the show? It's not key. And it's not even the Holy Spirit. It's God. He can control my thoughts, my words, my physical movement. And he does. And he can speak to me if he wants to. And he, I can only say those things that he would want me to say. And in the manner he would want me to say it. What kind of emotion to show? He controls emotions. He said, I created emotion, Keith, and he's proven it to me. I mean, you can be in the greatest mood in the world, and in an instant, you can be in a deep depression. You can be in a deep grief over losing a loved one. He's shown me more than one time. And it's fearsome. It's fearsome. It's not, it's not something that's easy to go through by any stretch of the imagination. But it does change you. I am not the man I was when we started. And if you read the book, The Life of God's Righteous Servant, you can see it. You can see what my life was until I was age 50. And then see what it's like right now. And who I am now. It's very interesting. And as I said, if you're not a man in divine beings, it's the only way any man could perform the task of the four righteous servants. It's the only way. Great names, fun to say, I'm David, I'm Elijah, I'm Papa Mike Moses. I'm God's righteous servant. The important one is, I'm a man of divine beings. And God's been doing it, he did it throughout the Hebrew Bible. His spirit aligns upon you, he enters you, and then you can hear God speak because God is in his spirit. Well, that's the top ten. That's not all of them, by the way. That's just the top ten. I bet I could come up with another ten. But in any event, if the rabbis want to remove themselves from dismissal, have themselves entered into the scroll of remembrance, see the heaven God is creating, and by the way, he's taking me there in vision dozens of times. And I promise you, you do not want to miss it. I promise you. It is something else. They're going to have to teach the manners of those two books. They're on the internet, WordPress site, Keith McCarty, McCarty.wordpress.com. Uh, and, and, I do every single chapter of both books uh, on YouTube. So, you can, you know, you get more out of it if you read it, because you can think more than just listen to me, just go, 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 and talk, talk, talk. But every time you see me, I'm reading from those books. I'm reading from those books. Thank you very much for listening.